Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let's actually get started. So, uh, welcome, Professor Hans. It's, it's really nice to have you. So, uh, I'll have a quick introduction. So, Professor Hans is a professor of financial economics at the University of Zurich and the uh, vice director of the Department of Banking and Finance. Uh, Professor Hans is also affiliated with the CFA International Scientific Adv Advisory Board and the Swiss Finance Institute Fellow, um, as well as the um, URPP Regulation of the Financial Markets Project client advice. Uh, uh, Professor Hans is also a founding partner of the UEH uh, spin-off firm, Behavioral Finance Solutions, a president of the pension fund, uh, Rent Fabric, and a board member of um, PACFM AG. And his research interests include um, evolutionary finance, uh, behavioral finance, fintech, and blockchain. Uh, we are really happy to have you here. So uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much for inviting me and good afternoon in Beijing. So let me share the slides. Can you see this? Can, can you see the slides? Uh, yeah, it's perfect. We okay. can see it. Thank you. So this presentation is on evolutionary portfolio theory. Portfolio theory is well known in finance and the addition which my co-authors and me have added to this is this evolutionary perspective. So the idea is to view the market as an interaction of investments and investment strategies. And then this will give rise to a complicated game, a dynamic complicated game. But fortunately, one can solve the game by evolutionary concepts like evolutionary stability and survival. So that's the main point. I would also like to mention my co-authors because without them, I would not be here. In particular, Igor F. Signeev, he is a very good Russian mathematician and Klaus Rainer Schenkope, he first studied mathematics in Germany, they're both now at the University of Manchester. Raba Amir, he's a very good game theorist. He's now in the US. And then there are a couple of PhD students who have contributed to this. And one of the PhD students, Enrico De Giorgi, he became a professor in mathematics at the University of St. Gallen. And as you can see here, there are some co-authors not listed, so I hope if you are interested in this theory, you will join me on evolutionary portfolio theory. So the agenda is, I will do some introduction, I will give you a literature review on portfolio theory, I will explain where in the literature does evolutionary portfolio theory fit, and then we go straight into the model because you're a group of mathematical economists, so I'm not shy to present a model. I also will give some ideas on the proofs which we do in this type of models. So the results are based on mathematical proofs and not on simulations, which you also find sometimes in evolutionary theories. Finally, I will give an application. So where real money is invested according to evolutionary portfolio theory, I will do a conclusion and point out which papers are used for this presentation. You can ask questions anytime, but there will also be time at the end. So the introduction is a simple question, as you might think, how should an investor, in my notation, T is called I, in period T, allocate a given amount of wells? So this is WIT, among k different assets. The way we write the decision of the investor is by so-called wealth shares. So the lambda i take k is the percentage of wealth which investor i in period t allocates to asset k. So the sum over this lambda i take k, this will add up to one. These are percentages how the wealth is split. There are simple suggestions which you find, for example, in the Talmud. They say you should invest one third of your wealth into equity, one third into gold, and one third into real estate. 
or a common practitioner's rule is 60% of equity and 40% of bond. For example, the Norwegian oil fund has been following the 60-40 rule for a long, long time, many decades. Or some other researchers, they suggest you should do a split according to the yields which you get from the assets. For example, the relative dividend yield on equity, but you can expand this idea also to include yields from real estate or yields from other asset classes. Finally, it has become more and more popular recently. Many people suggest we should not do any deviations from the market, but we should do a passive strategy. We should structure our wealth shares according to the relative market capitalization. If you do this, you are so-called indexing, then you are a passive investor. So the question now is, can theory improve on this? So these are practical suggestions, but can theory help to do better than these practical suggestions? So the next slide will show you what has been done in theory. So this is my literature review to position evolutionary finance in the literature. Okay, so let's start with portfolio theory as it's known. This is the called called Markowitz theory, which goes back to a paper of Harry Markowitz in the Journal of Finance in the year 1950, or 1952, sorry, in the Journal of Finance 1952. So an old paper, if you like. So the main idea of Harry Markowitz was to say, okay, let's think of two dimensions. So let's think about the reward which you get from your assets. So he measured this by the expected return. And let's think about the risk which you get from the asset. He measured this by the standard deviation from the assets. Then you can compute a so-called efficient frontier when you do portfolio allocation for any level of risk which you are willing to swallow. You can maximize the expected return. And if you change the level of risk, then you get the so-called efficient frontier. And then the result is saying, okay, if on top of that, you can also invest into a risk-free asset, which is here, which has no risk, then the, the solution which you should take is the so-called tangential portfolio. So this was the idea of Markowitz, invest into this portfolio here, which has the highest ratio of expected return to standard deviation, the so-called sharp ratio. So what was the next step? The next step was to say, well, this is a clever suggestion. However, what happens if everybody's doing it? So do we suffer from crowdedness, for example, if everybody's doing the mean variance optimization? And the answer was the capital asset pricing model. So if everyone is doing the mean variance optimization, so what you get is this line, the so-called security market line, where the risk is now measured as the covariance to the so-called market portfolio, and you only get rewarded by the higher risk in terms of the market portfolio, so-called beta coefficient. Okay, so then this was level one because there was an equilibrium consideration. Level zero was a portfolio consideration. Level one was asking what happens if everyone is doing that. But then of course, you can also ask what happens if people are not doing mean variance? So then this gives the idea to a so-called asset market game where the investors as a strategy, they can use their asset allocations, lambda i, t, k. These asset allocations come together in the markets by demand and supply, and they will result into payoffs. So this is a game like in game theory you have actions you have payoffs and then the question is how can we solve this the so-called heterogeneous agent models this have been started by the santa fe institute in the 90s they did not find mathematical solutions they said okay let's do a couple of simulations on these asset market games 
in order to do simulations, you have to restrict the number of strategies. For example, the standard case is you have a fundamental strategy and you have a momentum strategy. Maybe you add in some noise strategy and then you can see what asset prices will come out of the interaction of the three. So for example, chaotic movements on the asset markets and this and that, this was the result of the Santa Fe Institute. You might also say, well, we might solve the asset market game by imposing more and more economic concepts. For example, the general equilibrium models, they say that the actions which you find here, they are generated by utility maximization since time is concerned and since there is uncertainty. So you maximize expected utility over, for example, some consumption into the future. And then if people generate their actions, the asset allocations by expected utility maximization, they have to make some guesses about future allocations, which they can get in equilibrium. So you need to evoke an equilibrium concept where in any period in time T, people anticipate the equilibrium in the future. So this is an assumption of so-called perfect foresight which is of course a very strong rationality assumption. So if you do this, if you make the assumption of perfect foresight, then you can show results like this equilibrium they exist and the main asset pricing comes from an Euler equation from this intertemporal optimization where from one period to the next, you can look at the optimality of your strategy, Euler equation. In particular, if you make assumptions on the utility function, if the utility function is quadratic, so c to the square and has a linear term, c plus maybe a c to the square. So for a quadratic utility function, you come back to the capital asset pricing model. So this way, the capital asset pricing model is a special case of the general equilibrium model. The only problem is this strong assumption of perfect foresight. So where is evolutionary portfolio theory? Evolutionary portfolio theory is somewhere in between. So it assumes that there are equilibria, but we assume there are only short run equilibria, meaning those markets which are open, they will find an equilibrium. But in contrast to the perfect foresight assumption used in general equilibrium, we do not assume markets to clear in expectations. So the equilibrium concept of perfect foresight, which was invented by Ratner in 1978, was an equilibrium in prices and price expectations. So we don't do that, but we only say those markets which are open, they will clear. And whether the markets tomorrow will clear, we have to wait for tomorrow. So this is this notion of so-called short run equilibrium. Moreover, we describe the interaction of the actions of the investors. So we don't care about the intentions, whether they maximize utility, whether they apply heuristics, whether they do mean variance. So we don't care for the evolution, which strategy will be better. It matters what the strategies are doing and not out of which motivation the strategies have been done. And then the third idea is the evolution of wealth. So you want to look at how wealth is multiplying over time. And this is also done in heterogeneous agent models. To solve the model mathematically, we use evolutionary concepts like a survival strategy. A survival strategy is a strategy that has the highest growth rate of wealth and also evolutionary stability. This is a strategy once it has conquered the market, every mutant strategy or incumbent strategy will be driven out from the market. So fortunately, using this solution concepts, we can solve the general asset market game without restricting to a few strategies like in the heterogeneous agent models and without evoking strong assumptions on the rationality like perfect foresight. So this is the contribution of evolutionary portfolio theory to portfolio theory. So it's an equilibrium theory, a sequence of equilibria, a dynamic equilibrium theory with 
the actions at the focus and not the intentions and with a solution concept, a survival strategy and evolutionary stability. Okay, so now let me cite some papers on evolutionary portfolio theory, some milestones of evolutionary portfolio theory. So when I started thinking about this, this was during the time of my PhD, the paper of Bloom and Easley in Journal of Economic Theory 92 was already around. So this paper on Bloom and Easley, they ask, what is the survival strategy? So which strategy has the highest growth rate of wells, but in a very restricted setting? So they use so-called short-lived arrow securities. Short-lived means you buy an asset and it pays off tomorrow and then it is gone away. Then you have to buy the next asset, it pays off a day later, and then again it ceases to exist, and then you buy a next asset and so on. So it's short-lived assets, meaning there are no capital gains. There's only payoffs, 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 but there's no retrading, there are no capital gains. In particular, error security means the short-lived assets, they have a simple diagonal structure. So this means it's a diagonal matrix, the asset payoff matrix. So the payoff matrix is structured by the possible states of the world, state one to state capital S, and then the columns of the matrix are the assets, asset K equal one up to K equal K. So then a diagonal structure means you can identify payoffs with states. And the result which Bloom and Easley found was the best strategy which you should do is, let's call it a lambda strategy star to denote that it's the best strategy which you should invest in asset K should be equal to the probability of the state K to occur because you can identify states with assets. You can talk about the probability of a asset. And so the probabilities are probabilities of the states, but of course, since it's an one-to-one -one mapping between states and assets in a diagonal security setting. This is called betting your beliefs. So you should invest according to your probability beliefs. So the famous rule, betting your beliefs. So the first advancement was to generalize this to a general payoff structure. So in this paper with Klaus Schenkupe in the Journal of Mathematical Economics, we said, okay, this is unrealistic to have error securities, but let's work with any asset payoff structure A. So this can be diagonal, can be complete markets, meaning as many assets than states of the world, but can also be incomplete markets, less assets than states of the world. So any asset payoff matrix A. And then we could show which strategy is evolutionary stable. At the point, we could not yet show which is the survival strategy, but we could show, suppose a strategy is conquering the market, will it be able to drive out other strategies? And then the first result which we found was, now the best investment strategy has to invest according to the expected. So this is with respect to the probability measure for the states to occur the expected relative payoffs. So this is the payoff of asset K divided by the sum of the payoffs of asset K, of all assets, sorry. And so in particular, if you look back to the case of error securities, this is a generalization. So if you have a diagonal structure and the sum, <coughs> this is then a generalization, then you would again bet your beliefs. But this was the first result which could get rid of the diagonal structure, which is complicated now because there will be interactions between market, side effects, cross effects, and all these type of things. So the next breakthrough was in JET 2008, where we could look at long-lived assets. So long-lived asset means the payoff of an asset K in the next period T, this is equal to the price of the asset because now we can resell the asset in that period and possibly also generate some cash flows, for example, dividends in the next period. So this now is the payoff structure. 
So this is another more realistic case, but adds another complication. Now the prices, they enter into the payoffs and the prices themselves that will be generated by demand and supply of the strategies. So this was a very complicated mathematical problem because you have more and more feedbacks into the model and you could show there exists a survival strategy. The survival strategy having the highest growth rate of wells and all the others have a smaller growth rate of wells. And then what it turned out to be the survival strategy, the strategy, let's still call it lambda star, surprisingly does not need any information on the prices, but it has to be the expected relative dividends. So the expectation with respect to the probability measure, and then you have to take the dividends, the exogenous payments, the dividends divided by the sum of the dividends. So this was the surprise that ultimately the price fluctuations, they don't matter for your survival. They are endogenous. And what matters ultimately is only the exogenous payoffs, the dividends. So then we did a generalization to include short selling. Ever since Bloom and Easley, the lambda were restricted to be non-negative. But in this paper in economic theory, which came out last uh, this year, so in electronic form last year, but now in this year, the lambdas could also be long and short. They could be positive and negative entries. So this was a breakthrough again, I would say. However, the result was still the same. We could show even if you do shorting, you cannot do better than this strategy there. And finally, this is how you got interested in my research in a recent paper and the proceedings of the National Academy of Science. We have been the first to do asset pricing models in this evolution portfolio theory where the payoffs are generated with a production function. So now the payoff of an asset A of, in, of a asset K in period T is equal to the price, the resale value at which you can resell it and the dividends, but the dividends they are produced by a production function. And how are they produced? They are produced by the market capital that you put into it. And so there's another feedback here. So the higher the market capital, the more the investments the firm can do. So the higher the dividends it can generate. And interestingly, interestingly enough, it's still this strategy here, which is the best strategy now. However, we at the stage of evolutionary stability again. So this strategy, if it has conquered the market, no other strategy can gain in relative terms to this strategy. So this is the, let's say, milestones in evolutionary portfolio theory to which we have contributed. So now let's give you some idea of the model. So the market ecology, as I mentioned before, is described by the strategies of some investors. And the entities at which we look is these percentages, the so-called asset allocations. This is natural in finance. Everything is written in those models in returns and asset allocations. Also, here in the model which I show you, I will include a so-called consumption good. So people can not only invest, but they can also withdraw. The consumption good is risk-free. So we, they can also withdraw. They can take out wells from the process. So that's also important. Then we have to do a stochastic structure to model uncertainty. So we have a set of states of the world, capital omega, for example, you might say it can be heads and tails. So then you toss a coin. And then to denote a tree, for example, a tree like this, a binomial tree, heads and tails, and again, heads and tails, there's a convenient notation to do this by playing a bit with the notation. So the omega lower t, that's the state of the world, which is drawn in period t, and the omega upper t, that's the sequence of the states of the world. So this means, for example, this node here will be described at SH and T. So this 
uniquely determines where you are in the uncertainty structure if you write down the sequence. So this notation is convenient because you don't need to deal with so-called measurability constraints that all your decision variables have to be adapted to the information processes if they depend on this pass notation, let's say, it's clear they are measurable with respect to the information content. Okay, so now let's look at the evolution of wells. So if an investor in period T has this wells WIT, then we are at a certain node in the tree, for example, in this node. So what is this wells in the next period? WIT plus one. Well, the next uncertainty step will be drawn. So the omega t will be extended by one further draw. So the omega t plus one, this is one further resolution of the uncertainty. So that's the previous omega t plus the next state of the world, which has been drawn, omega lowercase t plus one. Okay, so this is the uncertainty structure. And then, well, it depends on your returns. So these are the gross returns which you make. So this is the dividend payoffs which you make plus the capital gains divided by the price which you pay this period. And then you steer the returns with your asset allocations. So in period T, given the information omega T, you split your wells W, I, T, according to these different assets and they give you returns. So these are the gross returns R the, of any asset K in period T plus one, depending of course on the next iteration where you are in the states of the world. So that's a natural, a natural evolution of wells. So it's just accounting, there are no assumptions. So I should highlight at the moment we have done no assumptions. We have just done accounting. So now here is an assumption which I think is acceptable. So now we assume that when the strategies come in the market and they generate demand and supply, the financial market is efficient enough to clear the market. So this was a good assumption up to the global financial crisis where at some days the market did not clear. But generally, I think it's a good assumption. So what does it mean? So this means that if you rewrite demand and supply, so let me help you with this. So if this is the supply of the asset, let's denote it by theta key bar, this is the supply. Now let's look at the demand and then the demand of the assets goes by the summation of the investors. And then you have to figure out what do they demand? Well, they demand a fraction of wells, which they put into asset K in period T times the wealth which the investors have in period T divided by the price. So this gives the demand of an investor for asset K in period T. So the fraction of wealth might be 10%, your wealth might be a million, then you have 100,000 which you invest into a stock like Baidu. And then if the price of Baidu is 10, you get uh, 10,000 units. So rewriting this equation, demand equals supply, you see it's a pricing equation. So the price, if you multiply with Q and you divide by the supply, the price is something like the average strategy in the market, the average asset allocation. So this then has to be plugged in here in any period T and also T plus one. Okay, so this is the equation again. And now, I do a lot of, I do a few rearrangements of things, but you can look at the slides later if you like. So now the trick is to rewrite the dynamical system in terms of relative wells and in terms of a real dynamical system. So this is the evolution of wells without the omegas to simplify the notation, which we have had before. Then we divide by aggregate wells in period T plus one, by aggregate wells in period T. In order to make this consistent, we divide the prices of period T and here the dividends and the payoffs in T plus one. Then we have to find the relation between the aggregate wells and the aggregate dividends. And this is found by the budget equations because the investors, they uh, 
exhaust their budgets, meaning the sum over the lambda IKs. This is the budget constraint, the sum of the lambda IKs in period T. If you sum over the assets, the K equals zero. If you include the risk-free asset to K, this is equal to one. So this is the budget constraint written in terms of percentages. You use that, the budget constraint, and then you find the relation between the aggregate payoffs, so the aggregate wells and the aggregate payoffs. Okay, and then using this, you rewrite everything in terms of relative wells. So this is done already here. This is absolute wells divided by the sum of absolute wells. So this will get relative wells, relative wells, and so on. And then you get so-called relative dividends. So this is dividend of asset K divided by the sum of the dividend. So this is an important notation. I should highlight this dividend of K T plus one this is the so-called relative dividend. So that's the dividend of asset K in T divided by the sum of the dividends of all the assets. So as you might remember from my slide concerning the <clears throat> literature overview, this is important for the survival strategies. Okay, so now we have some complication here because here are the prices of the next period and we want to have a dynamical system. So we have to solve this explicitly. So this is the relative values in the next period, relative values in this period, but in the lambdas, which is the average market capitalization, also the prices occur. So we have to solve it. So we, but fortunately it's a simple linear algebra step. So we can solve this linear part here and we get finally the random dynamical system. So now this is a vector of relative wells for all investors in the next period. And the RIs, this are, is a vector of the relative wells in the previous period. And now you see it has two components. It has this payoff component and it has the capital gains component. The capital gains component, since it's here and also on the left-hand side, we have this inverse. So this equation, which you now see, it's an equation, a flow equation from relative wells in period T to relative wells in period T plus one. So this is so-called a dynamical system. But it's a complicated dynamical system. It's a nonlinear dynamical system. You divide by relative wells. You have the inverse here, and it's a stochastic dynamical system because the payoffs, they depend on the uncertainty and also the strategies. They depend on the uncertainty. You can include momentum strategies and all these type of things. Okay, so mathematically, it's a random dynamical system, a mapping from the simplex to the simplex. So that's nice. The, the asset allocations, that's the budget constraints, they add up to one. So that's the budget constraint. And in the simple case, we use the non-negativity constraint. So the no short selling constraint. In generalizations, we do without, but in the simple case, we do a mapping from the simplex to the simplex, which is stochastic, but it's a flow equation. So everything in period T is on the right-hand side and everything in period T plus one with respect to relative values is on the left-hand side. Okay, so what assumptions did we use? We assumed short-run equilibrium and an assumption which I didn't mention, we assume a common consumption rate. So this means the lambda I zero the fraction of wealth which is taken out from the investment process, this is the same for all investors. So why do we make this assumption? You might say this is strong, but I think it's a legitimate assumption because the question which we ask is, what is the best investment strategy which makes you rich in the future? And of course, if you save more, you're richer in the future. So we have to have all investment strategies doing the same consumption rate. Otherwise, uh, let's say a mediocre investment strategy, which does not consume, would overtake a good investment strategy, which consumes a lot. And so for the question which we are analyzing, what is the best investment strategy? It's a legitimate assumption to assume this common consumption rate. And if you go back 
where, we, where did we assume this? It was here. And so when we do the relation between the aggregate weight and the aggregate dividends, we assume a common consumption rate. Okay, so that's the, the challenge. So now you could say, okay, a dynamical system, you can simulate so it's a mapping from t to t plus one and then we can simulate you might even put it on an excel spreadsheet and you might see what happens so like the santa fe institute was doing now you could say okay forget about analytic solutions now we do simulations fortunately we can solve this which is an amazing step in mathematics i would say this is a random dynamical system which is non-linear a non-linear first order difference equation with stochastics huh? So this is also mathematically a, a huge result, a huge achievement that we can solve it. So how can we solve it? We can solve it by asking the right questions. So we can ask for evolutionary stability. So strategy I is evolutionary stable when given the income, given it is the incumbent strategy. So given this strategy is the only strategy in the market, the relative values of every mutant strategy shrinks. So this shrinks on all paths. So the convergence is P almost surely. It does not shrink in expectation, but whenever you go on the tree, whatever path you choose, it will shrink. So it's P almost surely. It shrinks on every path, the relative wealth of the incumbent strategy. So that's very strong, much stronger than shrinking in expectation. And we can ask for survival strategies. So which strategy has the highest growth rate of wells? Again, P almost surely, meaning pathwise and not in expectation. So that's a very strong convergence result. Okay, so now how can you analyze dynamical systems? The trick is the so-called Lyapunov exponent, which is something like the local growth rate of the dynamical system. And if you do the mathematics of that, what you see is the local growth rate can be described like this. So let's call it G. This is the growth rate of relative values of a strategy I, lambda I, given the market plays lambda M. And the market, this is the average strategy which you see. So this is what I've shown before. So lambda M, this is the sum over the investors I with the relative values Ri. So this is in game theoretic firms saying you're playing the field. The interaction of the investors is via the average. And you can solve this. This has been done first time in economic theory 2008 to do the local growth rates. You can solve it. And then what you find is the expected logarithm. The logarithm is natural because it's a multiplicative process, relative wells times the returns gives relative values in the next period. So it's a multiplicative process. So you take the logarithm. So it's the expected logarithm of what? Of the relative dividends, basically, where you have the strategy I here divided by the prices, which are determined by the market. And then you have the consumption rate and the reinvestment rate and this and that. So this is the, the feature or the solution to the equations, if you like, which you can analyze. So this was first done in the paper with Etzigneye, Fens, and Schenkopi in Economic Theory 2006. Okay, so what are properties of these local growth rates, the Lyapunov functions? So first of all, a passive investment keeps you relative well. So let's check it. So if your lambda i is equal to the market, so if you if you are doing an indexing strategy, so then the lambda i is equal to the market. So if this is equal to the market strategy, lambda m. So what happens in this passive allocation? In that case, this thing cancels. The relative dividends, they add up to one. This is the definition of relatives. And then you have one minus lambda plus lambda. Again, this adds up to one. And the logarithm of one is zero. So this is the first result. You see, okay, we can do passive investing and we will survive. The most deeper result is what is uh, active strategy, which is driving out all other strategies. 
excluding the passive strategy, of course. And the result is, as I mentioned before, the expected relative dividend strategies. Now we have also consumption, so every strategy has a reinvestment rate of one minus lambda zero. So we can prove this strategy is the unique evolutionary stable strategy. <clears throat> and we can prove, so this strategy is also the unique survival strategy, but this will come later, unique in the set of the so-called basic strategies. Okay, in the interest of time, I don't go through the proof, but you can look at this. This is school mathematics now. You want to find a maximum of the relative growth rate at a given point. So this is school mathematics. You write the growth rate function. You take the, the gradient of the growth rate function. You have the restriction of the budget constraint. And then it's school mathematics. You can convince yourself indeed at a point lambda star, this function finds a maximum. So there's the evolutionary stability result, but moreover, in later papers, in this paper here in JET 2008, we could prove the global stability result. And so the strategy which you have seen is also a survival strategy. Now we cannot argue with the local G function that you've seen before. So now the proof is much more involved. It takes something like 20 pages and different lemmatas and this and that. So now it gets, it gets really tough, maybe to give you some intuition on that one. Let's go back to the equation, to the equation here. The, yes, maybe, maybe this equation gives you some intuition. So the good news is it's a multiplicative process. So when you take the log, then you have a concave function and then the log function certainly is concave in lambda i k t because it's linear, the return are linear in your asset allocation. And if you take the log because of the multiplicative structure, so then it's a concave function here. So this is very useful. And this property then you can use with some arguments in stochastics in order to even prove the survival strategy property of this lambda star. Okay, so the, and now the results which I've shown you were for a simple case where we assumed IID. So we assumed the relative dividends that are drawn like heads and tails with a stationary probability. But of course, you can generalize this, for example, to a Markovian case where you have uh, transition probabilities instead of IID probabilities, then the survival strategy is the this Markovian relative dividend strategy, or you can even do it without such assumptions. But if you do it without assumptions on the exogenous process, you only can implicitly define the best strategy, the survival strategy. So then it's defined by the solution to this equation here. And notice it's only the relative dividends, only the exogenous parts, which matter for this solution. The rho, this is the discount factor which you get from the consumption and the withdrawal process. And so the good news is the game is explicitly, it's solvable in this case implicitly when you don't put assumptions on the dividend process, but there are still the general features. So the result will be, you should invest fundamentally according to dividends and not according to prices. You should diversify properly and this and that. So some old wisdoms can be proved analytically in the most general cases. Okay, so let's look at an application in the next five minutes and then we still have time for questions. So the recent paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, as I mentioned before, is now producing the exogenous payoffs, the dividends by production function. So this is again a next milestone in the theory. And if you look at asset pricing models, there are very few which have, have these features. 
So typically they're based on exogenous payoffs, the so-called Lucas type of models. So here, this was a huge step forward to say, okay, let's be more realistic here. And let's say the firms, they go to on the market, they raise capital and the more capital they have, the more they can produce. So then we did an empirical analysis to check what might be a good fit to such production functions. So we took a simple uh, concave function. So here's a coefficient and then it's a power function with a BK between zero and one. So it's a very simple concave function, meaning more capital will give you more dividends, but at a decreasing rate. Uh, so this is the, it should not, the rate should be decreasing, not the levels. So it's an increasing function all over the place at a decreasing rate. So this is the capital which you, which you can get from the capital market in the previous period, and then you use it to invest in the period later, you get this dividend. So this was a good fit for the US data. And for most assets, the coefficient was something like 0 0.8, if I remember correctly. So uh, not much curved function actually. So now, if you know a bit of corporate finance, a key idea of corporate finance is the so-called return on equity. So what is the return on equity in our model? Well, that's what you produce with the equity divided by the equity which you put in. And so this ratio here, the F of lambda MK divided by lambda MK, this is the so-called return on equity. So now let's understand our winning strategy, which is still the winning strategy according to the results in this PNAS paper in terms of return on equity. So the winning strategy now, the D can be replaced by F, but the F by using the notion of return on equity is equal to the return on equity times the market capitalization. So this means the winning strategy from that perspective has a passive and an active component. So if you ignore the returns on equity, so if you don't take care in your investment strategy by the return on equity, then it's a passive strategy. The winning strategy is allocating according to relative market capitalization, which was the passive strategy. But if you do not ignore it, and if you, let's say, ignore the market capitalization, so the, the indexing part, then it's a very active strategy. So then it's only a strategy on the relative return on equity. So if there is one company, Baidu, Tencent, which has very good profits and has a high return on equity, let's say, then you should invest more into that than into Volkswagen, which has a low return on equity. So you could put more money into growth firms than into value firms. So this is a nice feature. It's an active passive mix. If we refer to return on equity and relative market capitalization as the diversification rule for your strategy. Okay, so a friend of mine, Andreas Beck, he said, oh, that's a great idea, let's make money. So he has done a fund called the Global Portfolio One Fund, which is doing this. So it invests worldwide into ETFs according to this return on equity. And it's a mixture of active and passive. So generally it's passive, but then in times of the crisis, it will change the asset allocation. So in normal times, it has 80% the world corporation, meaning this broad ETFs and 20% cash. In times of scarcity, when the return on equity goes up because there is a crisis like Corona crisis, you increase the asset allocation to equity, you decrease the cash allocation, and if there's an escalation of scarcity, then the return on equity is extremely high. Then you go full in 100% into the ETF. And he does it successfully. Here's the Corona times, for example, where he increased by 10% the asset allocation. And then in the fall, at least in Europe, markets calm down and then he decreased again. And so it's a Passive strategy because it's an ETF strategy based on MSCI World ETFs and so on. 
but then it has an active component based on return on equity in the crisis period. Okay, so let me conclude. So I have hoped to make the following points. So based on minimal assumptions, so what did we assume? We assumed the short run equilibrium of demand and supply and we assumed the common consumption rate, which we could assume because we want to see what is the best investment rule and what is the best consumption rule. So based on minimal assumptions, we could solve the asset market game. So every investor puts his asset allocation, lambda i, tk, they're in interaction on the, on the market. This generates prices and prices are important for returns. Returns are important for evolution of wealth. So this gives a relative complicated random dynamical system, but we could solve it. How? By evoking evolutionary concepts. We cannot solve it otherwise. Maybe you have other ideas to solve it, but we could solve this nonlinear stochastic difference equation by evoking evolutionary concepts and also up-to-date mathematics. So fortunately, the random dynamical systems, the mathematics for that was started in the 80s of last century and now 40 years in researching this, we have good tools for the random dynamical systems. So the results show that one should invest according to the relative dividends or if you include product production function, return on investments. And in an application, an ETF has been set up, which invests accordingly. Okay, if you want to read, here are the standard references of the models which I cited, and here are the references on the evolutionary portfolio theory. If you don't want to read, if you want to listen about this in YouTube, for example, there are some links to YouTube where I gave presentations and for the CFA, for example, I gave a presentation on this and Andrew Law was there also giving a presentation because he shares the same ideas, but he does different type of models. So it was very interesting for him too. I did a presentation in India, which was also very interesting, I think. And maybe if you like my presentation, next time I can put a link to the presentation which you have recorded now. Okay, thank you very much. We still have some time for discussion. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks very much, um, Professor Hans, for walking us through this uh, series of very important developments, actually. Um, I, I actually noticed that um, some of these ideas have been uh, incorporated into a recent textbook you wrote, uh, which is- Right, uh, that's true, yes. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and we're also, the only... we are also on the way to writing a monograph where all the models, all the theories are there, but so far we always get more results. So, <laughs> so we didn't want to close the monograph, but at some point, hopefully we will finish it. Yes, yes, looking forward to see, see that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so, um, yeah. The audience, please feel free to um, ask questions. Um, but so um, let me stop sharing so then I can see you better. Sounds good. Yeah. Maybe uh, let me kick off uh, with a question while the audience is preparing. So, um, so one um, one question that I always get um, while applying these evolutionary ideas to finance is that, um, like, how many generations do I do I need? To achieve selection uh, like this, actually, so uh, I'll, can we live long enough to wait for the final yeah. outcome? So yeah, so yes. I'm wondering. So, the, so this Lyapunov exponent, which I've shown you, is the so-called exponential growth rate. So it goes quite rapidly. And if you do simulations, for example, where you do a contest, where you have some strategies like the one over n strategy or momentum strategies or mean variance strategies, so something like ten or maybe 20 iterations where the survival strategy has conquered something like 80% of the wells when it starts at an equal distribution. So it's quite, quite rapidly. Also, some I consult some pension funds here in Switzerland. They have implemented it in their asset allocation and they're doing much, much better than the other pension funds. So it's surprisingly rapidly, even though mathematically, it's a convergence result in the long run, but Practically, 
if you put in numbers from the stock market, it's something like, let's say 10 years, maybe 20 years, so that you're really better off than the others. Yeah. But it doesn't yeah, work thanks. in 10 days, so it's, so it's 10, 10 years. <laughs> Yeah, uh, need some 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 horizon to 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 for that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But if you invest in the equity market and you only have time for ten days, you should better not do it. Huh? So if yes, you have yes. investment horizon of ten years, you can invest in the equity market. And if you're doing, you should do it like that. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. Um, okay, so uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave more time to the audience. So does the audience have any questions? I, I see there is Cleopatra in the audience. I thought she's, she's from Egypt. Uh, uh, hi, Professor Hans. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, have you considered the continuous time model? Yes. <clears throat> there are also two papers on continuous time. So the result is basically the same. The only problem is that the assumption is a bit strict that you say there will always be dividends paid. And so maybe it's justified when you say, okay, there are thousands of companies and the dividend payments, they are spread out over time. But what you see in reality is the dividend payment season. So it's the dividend payments are a little bit more discreet than continuous. But if you do continuous time, it's mathematically simpler dynamical systems in continuous time are easier to solve than in discrete time. So many things which make a complication, they locally, let's say, they are nice to you <laughs> when you do continuous time. But if you're interested, I can send you the papers from continuous time. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, because uh, there are many mathematical tools in continuous time. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so we No, can... that's true. Most, most mathematics has studied Stochastic dynamics in continuous time. Yes, that's the more, that's the easier case. Let's say yeah? Dif difference equations, nonlinear difference equations. They are tougher than the nonlinear differential equations. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, how about uh, if you have some uncertainties? Say you you have multi uh, probability space. You don't have one distribution. You have multi distributions. Have you considered this we, that? <clears throat> this we haven't looked at. So now we have the general information filtration, which are described with the omegas, and then we have a probability measure on that. So we did okay. not look into multiple probabilities. But as you have seen, for the most general result, we don't need to make assumptions on the stochastic process. So we don't need to do IID, Markovian, whatever, but we can implicitly solve it. <laughs> Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. There yeah, actually, I have a chat, right? Right. Um, yeah, I actually have a, have a quick follow-up uh, to something you just said. So, so you mentioned that the, the, the Omega space, you, you don't need to assume any IDness or Markovianness, but do, do you need some sort of stationarity um, uh, underneath that? Uh, because if, if Omega is like, Totally random over time, like in, in the sense of non. Uh, if it's non-stationary, then uh, intuition seems to break out. But the the interesting thing is you can still solve it, but only implicitly. So this was the equation where lambda star was the solution to uh, to an equation. So you don't need stationarity uh, <clears throat> like Markovian or other st stationarity, but of course the result then is also non-stationary. So then the lambda star <laughs> is a too complicated strategy which you are not able to implement. So for yeah. practical purposes, it's better to impose some stationarity because otherwise the strategy exists, but it's not implementable. Yeah, yeah, agree, yeah. Right. But it's still amazing, you know, the, the game chess, which the Indians play, for example, and their results like there's always a winning strategy, but we don't know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so and so yeah. this is our most general result, whatever the stochastic process, we know there is a winning strategy, we know some 
characteristics like invest fundamentally and not based on momentum and those things, but we cannot explicitly solve it in the general case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess if you don't give it some sort of control, then it's um, like there is meaningless, even if you solve it, right? Because you, right, the right. future can, can, can be a different. Experience. If you so, exactly yeah. for any applications, you need to impose some stationarity, yeah. otherwise, you cannot use data. If you don't impose stationarity, how can you do statistics or econometrics? Huh? So, in any yeah. application, you have to impose some stationarity, but from the pure yeah. theory. We still know there is a solution, but we don't know how it looks like, <laughs> like the, the chess example. Yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, any any final questions from the audience? Uh, hi, Professor. Hi. Uh, hi, hi, Ken. Uh, and I just got a question to ask. Um, I'm wondering, are you interested in your research and What's the motivation for you to research and communicate with people like us? Thank you. I'm very interested in my research. <laughs> so I, I hope I, I could show this. So the, I think portfolio theory is very important, has many important applications like pension funds, for example, or other applications. And I think so far research has put two strict assumptions which were not very practical and my research hopefully has made improvements to find a solution, to implement a solution. So I'm quite enthusiastic about my research and I communicate to you why, because you are professors in mathematical economics and quantitative finance. So that's why I've chosen a language today, which hopefully you understand. Sometimes I present to the CFA, for example, and they don't understand equations, so then it's more difficult. <laughs> but in your case, I was happy to get an invitation by mathematical economists. You might know I'm the advisory ed editor of the Journal of Mathematical Econ Economics. So I'm, I'm happy to see some people sharing these ideas that you should do rigorous models, apply mathematics and this and that. So that's why I came to you at least via Zoom, because I think you are the guys which make progress in in research, if you do rigorous mathematical economics and quantitative finance. Uh, okay, and uh, and one more. Um, what do you think of the research that uh, Peking University is doing? Um, how, how would you describe its work around the globe? Thank you. Which, which university? Uh, a Peking University. Peking University? Yeah. <laughs> You're a huge university. I have some friends, a former PhD colleague from mine, for example, is also at Peking University. You do many things, you do experiments, you do political things, all this is important, but your group is, let's say, most closely to what I've been doing, mathematical economics and quantitative finance. So I think that's why it was great that you invite me because I hope we have a common language. The other areas, also doing fascinating research, but to me it's harder to communicate with them because I'm not doing their type of research. Oh, okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, I think yeah. I think we are about time. So unless there are some final questions, uh, I think uh, we can stop here. And uh, thanks. Thanks very much again, Professor Han, for um, for taking the time to speak with us. And uh, yeah, I think that will conclude our um, seminar here. So uh, let me stop recording.